and welcome to another edition of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam and in today's show something very exciting that we're going to talk about is also something very serious. When we talk about antibiotics, the resistance to antibiotics is a conversation which is being talked about the world over with regards to how we're going to move forward as a people, as a species with the use of antibiotics. Now to talk about this today we have uh, Vanessa Daniel, she's the Deputy General Manager for, uh, for Clinical Affairs slash Pharmacologist for Pharma Nyaga Baraj. She joins us to talk about this very conversation that's ongoing around the world. Vanessa, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, uh, just to get into the uh, thick of things, let's talk about what are antibiotics firstly. Okay. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you for having me here today. So uh, to answer your question, what is antibiotics? Essentially, it's a drug, medicines that are designed to uh, treat uh, bacterial infections, okay? And that's it. Mm -hmm. They don't treat viral infections. They don't treat any other diseases caused by other pathogens. I think we need to remember that, okay? It was discovered uh, by Alexander Fleming, 1928. And uh, since then, we've got a series of antibiotics available in the market today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and when you uh, see a series of antibiotics available mm -hmm. in the market, uh, can you do you have a sort of a figure as to how many different types of antibiotics? Well, there are more than twenty types. More than twenty types of mm -hmm. antibiotics available. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and they treat illnesses uh, that are caused by different types of bacteria. So um, yeah. Now, w with regards to the use of antibiotics. Mm. A lot of us don't know why we need antibiotics, hence a lot of us, you know, uh, yeah. go to it all the time. It's yeah. like the, the go-to standard if I want to get well quick mm -hmm, for most mm -hmm. of us. So why, why does one need antibiotics? Maybe you can walk us through that. Okay. Um, let me start by saying that uh, all of us have an immune system. Now, if you're reasonably fit, your immune system is more than capable of taking care of infections, mm -hmm. okay, unless these are infections that are very serious or life-threatening. Okay. Now, when do you need antibiotics? Um, I would pose this question to my doctor. Right. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. You need antibiotics when you have an infection in your body caused by bacteria. <clears throat> Two questions you need to <coughs> let your doctor answer for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, would be one, do I really need antibiotics? And if I do, what kind do I need? Mm -hmm. But let, let the doctor who is well trained answer that question for you, if you need it or not. Right. Now, because this conversation, like I said earlier on, is happening around the world, mm. are doctors in Malaysia talking about this, are discussing this with their patients? What do you hear from your side? Okay. Uh, the Ministry of Health Malaysia uh, is very active, is very aware about the need for uh, awareness on antibiotic resistance. They have uh, guidelines and protocols for doctors and practitioners uh, to exercise the right type of uh, practices in order to reduce uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is in line with WHO's uh, call for the whole world to understand that antibiotics resistance is a global problem. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I would say yes, in Malaysia, the doctors are more than well aware of this, and uh, there are steps put in place by Ministry of Health. Right. When you say the steps put in place by the Ministry of Health, let's take this back a little bit and talk about what it is, what the problem really is. We all know, we, we hear of antibiotic resistance, but what is antibiotic mm, resistance? Okay, that's, that's a good question, and mm -hmm. I think everybody wants to know. Uh, let's not go too detailed into the technicalities of it, but. Simply put, antibiotic resistance is caused when uh, the antibiotic itself does not work on the bacteria. So if I have an illness caused by bacteria and I take an antibiotic, it doesn't get me better. So basically, uh, 
that would be the reason why we call it antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what causes antibiotic resistance? Why does this happen? So, antibiotic resistance uh, is mainly caused when bacteria mutates. Okay. Uh, when it mutates, it uh, becomes stronger. So, what happens is, uh, when I take the antibiotic, it doesn't work for me anymore. Okay. Uh, in Malaysia, there uh, there are st statistics that says antibiotic resistance for certain types of antibiotics uh, can go up to 61%. So that actually means there's 61% chance mm -hmm. that when I take an antibiotic, it wouldn't work for me, mm -hmm. a certain type of antibiotic. Right. Now, if, if you look at it as to where we are now, mm. apparently we found this out some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, how long ago or how far back do we go to know that we already had a problem with this? Wow. Uh, you'll be surprised, uh, Alexander Fleming, mm -hmm. when he discovered antibiotics, he, he won the Nobel Prize for right. this. And in his mm -hmm. speech uh, during the Nobel Prize uh, receipt, uh, he had already started talking about antibiotic resistance. So uh, it goes all the way back to, to the 1940s. Mm -hmm. So he knows, he knew back then that, knew, th yeah. that this was too much of a good thing. Right. right. <laughs> now, which brings me to my next question. Your advice, um, you're, a, you're a pharmacologist and uh, you're, you're trained right. to understand these things mm -hmm. differently from us. Now, what would be your advice to uh, the person watching and to consumers who are going out there mm -hmm. and dousing themselves with <laughs> antibiotics? Uh, yeah. uh, me, me being one of them. <laughs> okay, I wouldn't douse myself with antibiotics. Like that's, that's really a bad idea. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, but I think as, as uh, lay people, um, I would, I would uh, be able to practice certain steps that uh, that would help uh, prevent or reduce antibiotic resistance okay uh, some of the steps would be number one always make sure mm -hmm. to use antibiotics prescribed <coughs> by your doctor okay right. um, I wouldn't go to uh, a doctor and say and sit down and tell him you know what I'm sick I need antibiotics give it to me I wouldn't right. do that mm -hmm. okay um, doctors are trained professionally to identify whether you need them or not. Right. So but th this is exactly the thing <laughs> I did the last time around. So I had a cold, I had a bad cough and I went to uh, the doctor who uh, then said, uh, well, uh, we can give you something. So mm. I said, isn't antibiotics bad for you? And mm. he says, if you're taking it twice, three times a year, it isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> uh, he's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sometimes we need help. So our immune system can't always be on top form. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are times when, it, when we need help. And um, if you're getting this advice from a good doctor, he knows what he's doing, I would follow his advice. Right. Okay. Uh, but I would follow his advice to the T, meaning if he told you to take two tablets three mm -hmm. times a day, I would take two tablets three times a day. Most of us, by day two, you feel better and you say, mm, I'm, uh -huh. I don't want to take it anymore. Now, that's one of the major causes that leads to antibiotic resistance. So, Is not finishing, completing yeah, your Yeah, not course. completing your courses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is something that you shouldn't be doing. Right. And uh, I think if everybody started doing this, you know, following your doctor's advice properly, um, practicing good hygiene, mm -hmm. okay, uh, simple things like this can help to uh, combat this global problem. Right, so over-prescribing of antibiotics, mm. patients not taking antibiotics as instructed mm -hmm. by the doctor, treating viral and other non-bacterial infections with antibiotics. Yeah, that's a no-no, of yeah, course. That's a yeah, that's a no-no. Uh, when you say poor hygiene and sanitation practices, mm. how can you further explain this? When you say, uh, you know, how, uh, how do we practice this? Okay. Uh, simple steps, washing your hands, you know, when you're handling food, make sure you don't mm. contaminate the food with, uh, you know, dirty dishes. Uh, when you, after you go to the toilet, come back, wash your hands before you handle mm -hmm. anything. In hospitals, you know, uh, making sure that you wear the right protective gear when you're dealing with uh, conditions that are infectious. Simple things like this will help. Right. And, and when you walk into hospitals, mm. and this is just off the cuff, this is something that came to the mind. Um, you see all these little containers to sanitize your yeah. hands. Are these do these things help? Absolutely, hand they sanitizers. Help. Yes, they, they help. Absolutely, they do. Like I said, simple mm -hmm. steps. This could be one of your simple steps. You don't know where what you've touched. Um, doing this can certainly help. Right, right. In your answer, you also mentioned something about resistance cannot be eradicated. It's a natural phenomenon, right. according to you. Right. But we can do our part to slow it down mm -hmm. or maybe control it. 
-hmm. where with simple steps, mm -hmm. would you uh, walk us through that simple steps again? Only use anti antibiotics when prescribed by a doctor, mm -hmm. as you said before. Uh, choose antibiotic-free foods. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so uh, there's a lot of uh, livestock or poultry mm -hmm. out there uh, where they use antibiotics to uh, as part of the industry. Right. Uh, a lot of this is to promote growth and all that. Now, it's good when you use antibiotics mm -hmm. to um, treat illnesses in livestock. Uh, but if you overuse antibiotics, these bacteria in the livestock can become resistant mm. themselves. Right. So, uh, I mean, we're not... Uh, vegetarians, mm -hmm. we eat those mm -hmm. of us at least who eat. Most meat. of us are carnivorous. Yes, yeah. indeed we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, myself included. Now, uh, when I eat meat, and if that meat is contaminated with bacteria, especially drug-resistant mm -hmm. bacteria, well, you know, that's a can of worms for another day. Indeed, that, 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 that yes. indeed is open a bigger right. conversation. But what steps uh, can help reduce antibiotic resistance? Like we said before, maybe you can walk us through a little chart for you to have a look. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for bringing in this chart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have here uh, what we said earlier to mm. only use antibiotics prescribed by your doctor. You know. Not yourself. Okay. Not, not yourself. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Don't pressure your doctor to give you antibiotics like, Be like, uh, me. like what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely should not do that. Okay, always follow your doctor's advice when using antibiotics. So like I said just now, he tells you to take it two times a day, three times a week, right. then you do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, never share or use leftover antibiotics. Now, you know, some of what us... What a waste. <laughs> precisely, with that mindset, you would mm -hmm. keep, you know, let's say you have balances, you keep in the fridge. So your daughter has similar illnesses next week. Yeah. You say, mm, I want to save some money, I don't want to go to the doctor. Right. You uh, so self-diagnose That's a big no-no. No, no. definitely a, it's a big no-no. And finally, no. what would be uh, something else? Vaccinations. Can now, uh, I think most of us are vaccinated. It's mm -hmm. uh, one of those... Uh, yeah, but there's also a movement that's not. Yes. Yeah, let's not talk about let's that. Let's not talk about that today. Mm -hmm. But uh, for those of you who are uh, vaccinated, uh, vaccinated, please keep your vaccinations up to date. And if you're not, of course, uh, talk to your healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll advise you on what vaccinations, the pros of it. Right. So okay. I guess uh, we've got all the information we want with regards to uh, antibiotics and uh, the resistance of antibiotics that the world is facing. We just spoke to Vanessa Daniel, Deputy General Manager, Clinical Affairs slash Pharmacologist from Pharma Niagara Burhad. Vanessa, it was a pleasure and an honor having you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for joining us on Medical Day. Stay with us. We'll take a short break and come back with more for you right here on Medical Today BNC. Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders at 8.30 p.m. Monday, only on BNC. The Nation, a talk show from the Current Affairs Desk with in-depth conversations on health, women, property, culture and performing arts. Only on the Nama News Channel. Listen to views of industry captains. Analyze and examine trends and projections. 
gain market insights from subject matter experts. Biz Talk, every Friday, only on BNC. Adakah anda pernah mengisi apa-apa borang di pasaraya? Atau adakah anda pernah mengemaskini profil anda di media sosial? Jika begitu, anda baru saja berkongsi data pribadi anda dengan organisasi dan anda melakukannya setiap hari. Dengan adanya Akta Perlindungan Data Pribadi 2010 iaitu Akta 709, anda boleh memutuskan dengan siapa data pribadi anda boleh dikongsi dan dizahirkan agar tidak disalah guna. Hello, ladies, and welcome back to Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam. And of course, earlier on the show, you saw something very interesting about antibiotics or our resistance to antibiotics and how alarming the situation is. From there, from pharmaceuticals, let's move on to surgery. And we're going to be talking about femto second laser assisted cataract surgery. Joining me in the studio is Dr. Ainu Rahman bin Dr. Anwar Mazduki. He's a consultant ophthalmologist from Ramsey Saim Darby Healthcare to talk to us about problems of the eye. Doc, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, very interesting to have you here with your contraptions, which you're going to be uh, explaining to us in a short while. But uh, let's get to the thick of it and just find out what a cataract is. Thanks, Gerard, for having me uh, on board. Uh, a cataract is a natural process and is an aging process whereby the natural lens in the eye uh, starts to become cloudy. And if it becomes so cloudy that it prevents light from entering the eye, the patient literally becomes blind. Yeah? Uh, cataracts is not a recent problem, has been around since the beginning of time, I suppose, since mankind. And uh, common co problems uh, before you lose your vision totally is, you know, you may have blurring of vision, uh, difficulty reading in dim lights. You are driving at night, you may find that, you know, the light is a bit too bright. You, have, you see uh, uh, glare and hellos. Yeah? Uh, and uh, sometimes you may even see a bit of double vision. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, if you leave the cataract untreated, and if both eyes are affected, then you, you lose your vision. Yeah? Right. But uh, the blindness that you hear in someone who has cataract is not a permanent blindness. Mm -hmm. It's, it's reversible. It's reversible. Mm -hmm. right? That's an important fact. Mm -hmm. fact yeah? Now, right. uh, what, what you just spoke to us about, what you just told us about a cataract mm -hmm. with the eye becoming opaque, mm -hmm. which part of the eye? Can you mm -hmm. show us on this sure. what happens to the eye? Right. Yeah. Now, th this is a model of the eye. Mm -hmm. J just to orient it, uh, uh, ourselves. Right. This is the front part of the eye. Mm -hmm. If and you could just turn yeah. it forward. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this is the this front, the front part of the eye. This is yeah. the back part of the eye. The front part, we've got a clear tissue called the cornea. Mm -hmm. And uh, behind here, we've got the nerve, which is the wiring to the brain. In between these two structures, we've got the lens. Right. Uh, now, this is the lens of the part of the eye which becomes cataractus. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. So, in a young person, it's all clear, but as we age, it undergoes some aging changes. Then and it becomes opaque. becomes opaque. So, I'll just show you. So, so it's, yeah. it's this lens that becomes opaque and not Correct. on the outside? No, not, mm -hmm. not the cornea. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, from a clear lens to an opaque lens. Yeah? So, depending on how opaque the lens is, uh, it will affect the patient differently in terms of you know, how clear or blurred the image is. Right. Yeah? Um, well, when you talk about cataracts treatments, you say it's been around for the longest time mm. and there've, there's been treatment from time in remembrance. Mm. Is there a treatment for cataracts, uh, cataracts today and what, mm. what are the treatment procedures mm. like as mm. compared to what it was right. before? Now, uh, as you mentioned, cataract has been around since the beginning of mankind. Mm -hmm. yeah? And it's a problem right from the beginning. So even as early as 5th century BC, there has been records that uh, procedures to remove cataract to restore vision uh, was already done. Uh, and the, the procedure is not obviously mm -hmm. called laser cataract surgery, mm -hmm. it's called couching. Yeah? In couching, the principle is you have an opaque lens right. in the eye, it's blocking the vision, 
culching, what, what happens is either through a hard knock to the mm -hmm. eye, the lens is dislocated into the back of the eye or the vitreous. Right. We don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. Okay. But, uh, yeah. but I can, uh, uh, that's actually not exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in some parts of uh, uh, some countries mm -hmm. whereby they don't have uh, uh, access to modern uh, facilities. Couching is still being used. Couching is still being done. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, even I, 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 I've seen a video done of a documentary in 1995, even right. as uh, uh, early as 1995, mm -hmm. it was still being done. Yeah? Mm -hmm. right. Now, the, the problem with couching is uh, nobody wants to get knocked in the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's, it's, a it's not a nice feeling. It's not a nice feeling. Eye, yeah. you know? uh, and nobody wants uh, needles to be poked into the eye. And uh, the problem is uh, when you knock the lens into the back of the eye, sometimes the lens causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. And inflammation can damage the eye. You can actually cause or get blindness from the inflammation, even though you've just removed the cataract. Right. Yeah. So in the uh, development of cataract surgery, uh, the progress, progress in uh, cataract surgery is to improve upon this technique, to mm -hmm. make it more humane. Yeah. Uh, the next step was uh, something called ICCE. ICCE stands for intracapsular cataract extraction. Intracapsular? Cataract, cataract extraction. extraction. Yeah. In that process, the principle is instead of knocking the lens back into the eye, mm -hmm. you want to take the cataractous lens out of the eye. Right. Yeah? Now, like anything that you want to take out of a structure, you've got to create an opening. An yeah? incision of some sort. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the incision is made on the cornea. Right. It's a fairly large incision, almost 180 degrees across. It has to be as large as the lens. So once the incision is done, uh, a probe which has a very cold tip is inserted into the eye mm -hmm. and a tip which is very cold when it touches something a bit wet will get stuck right and then you pull the lens out mm -hmm. yeah? uh, it's a better procedure compared to couching uh, it's done in a more modern setting uh, but the problem with ICCE is you can't put a lens back into the eye. Mm -hmm. Basically, the eye is rendered what we call as a fake kick. Right. A fake kick meaning the eye has no lens. Yeah? Which means this method is rather primitive. Mm. Uh, it, it, I would consider, I wouldn't call it primitive, mm. but it's uh, the earliest form of modern cataract surgery. Okay, the yeah. earliest form. Of modern right. Cataract. Yeah. So from there, uh, the other other uh, sort of surgery you want to talk mm. about is the ECCE. That's now, right. what's that? Now, ECCE is uh, a procedure to basically again remove the cataract mm -hmm. but now you want to put a lens back into the eye right yeah? the reason why you couldn't put a back or a lens back into the eye in ICCE is because you take the whole cataract out together with a structure called the bag or mm -hmm. we call it also the capsule yeah? right the capsule is a very thin transparent tissue mm -hmm. which is like Membranous, a plastic bag yeah. like mm -hmm. a membrane mm -hmm. which envelops the lens and keeps the lens uh, centered in the eye. Right. Yeah? So in ECCE, we try to preserve that back. You know? So still you make a large incision on the cornea, but next what you do is you make an opening in the back and then you remove the contents of that back, which is your cataract, mm -hmm. out of the eye, but you leave behind that back. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because you have a back left in the eye, then you can put what we call as intraocular lenses artificial lenses right. into the eye. I've got some uh, models here to you know, mm -hmm. just basically show what intraocular lenses are. This is a giant model of mm -hmm. what a lens or intraocular lens looks like. Right. Yeah. The actual that's, lens... That's something mm. Goliath would use. Uh, sorry, can I... <laughs> that's yeah? something Goliath would use. Yes, you're <laughs> correct. <laughs> the actual lens is actually very small. Very small. Very yeah. small, yeah. Okay. So this is inserted into the eye and mm. in ECCE, because you've got that bag, the lens can sit in the eye. Right. Yeah? So uh, that's the explanation for ECC. So we've right. gone through ICC, mm -hmm. ECC. In this few minutes, maybe we can go to a phaco emulsification. Maybe you can walk us right. through that. And if time permits, we'll talk about flax. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. In 1967, Dr. Kalman uh, contributed a major advance in cataract surgery whereby the uh, surgery is performed not through a big incision on the cornea, 
which is almost 180 ac degrees across, but through an incision as small as 2.4 millimeters. Mm. Yeah. This was back in 67. Back in 67. Mm. Yeah. So it is like uh, you know comparing the Wright brothers and having a 747. Yeah. Right. It's a big major advance. Yeah. So uh, in phaco emulsification, you try to remove the lens, but without making a large opening. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you remove a structure, but you know uh, the structure is bigger than your opening? Yeah. So in phaco emulsification, what you do is you make a small cut on the cornea. Right. You still need to make an opening in the bag mm -hmm. so that you can access Which is the, the same as ECC. That's right, yeah. correct. And then you insert a probe or a vacuum tube into the eye uh, towards the lens and try to suck the lens out. Mm -hmm. However, the lens in someone who is cataractus is usually hard. Therefore, if you were just if you were to just use vacuum or suction to suck it out, nothing will come out. Imagine you have a glass of water and some ice at the bottom, and you want to suck the uh, ice out. Mm -hmm. You can't. You've got to mash the ice before you can suck the uh, the ice through the straw. Right. Yeah? So that's the same principle. So in phaco emulsification, phaco means lens. Mm -hmm. lens. Uh, uh, Faco means lens. That's yeah. right. Faco mm -hmm. means lens. To emulsify the lens. That's right. Mm -hmm. So at the end of this vacuum tip, what Dr. Kalman had did is he put an ultrasound tip. So it's a metal tip which vibrates at an ultrasonic level mm -hmm. uh, frequency to emulsify the lens. Then you can suck the solid lens out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a major advance because instead of having a big incision, you have a very small incision. Sometimes it's so small that you don't even have to stitch it. Yeah? Now, how much of a difference has this made? Imagine if you do, did, uh, let's say, an ECCE, mm -hmm. you'll get your best vision perhaps after three months. Right. If you do a good FACO, you'll get that vision tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Which leaves us with one other option. What we're going to do is we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Dr. Ainur is going to walk us through FLAX, F-L-A-C-S. It is a surgery. How is it done? We'll come back and give you some information as to how that's done right here on Medical Today. Stay with us. Nine Eleven menampilkan pelbagai segmen menarik khas buat anda. Saksikan Nine Eleven setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat 9 pagi hanya di Bernama News Channel. Hong心能趁沙亚阿莫伊拉，这个那么好的机会，就到全马各地旅游，我还能了解各州的文化。我们一起来开始我们的旅程吧。
Welcome back to Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam, and we're currently talking about eye surgery. Uh, we went through ICC, ECCE, we talked about phaco emulsification, all the options you have with regards to the removal of cataracts or eye surgery right here in Malaysia. We have with us Dr. Ainu Rahman bin Dr. Anwar Mazduki, a consultant ophthalmologist from Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare. Now, uh, we, we did talk extensively mm -hmm. about various procedures. Uh, let's talk about the difference between conventional and laser-assisted cataract surgery. Uh, would you uh, safely say that ICC, ECC, and phaco emulsification are conventional procedures? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so ECCE, uh, or rather ICCE, then ECCE, and uh, certainly phaco emulsification is still considered conventional surgery. It is still actually being done because certain eye conditions warrant the use of perhaps ICCE or even still ECCE. Yeah? So it's not something that has been abandoned but less used compared to phaco emulsification which is basically the uh, mainstay of cataract surgery now. Uh, so uh, uh, what we have next is what we call as femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. Right, we're going to walk you through that again. Mm. It's called femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. Uh, which in short is FLAX, F-L-A-C-S. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery is a recent advance in cataract surgery. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, it's uh, something that assists in the cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. So uh, what it does is uh, uh, it's basically a machine that helps the surgeon to do almost the first half of the surgery by the laser. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, roughly mention which parts of the procedure is done by the laser. If you remember when I mentioned ECCE, ICCE and FICO emulsification, there is still some basic principles that we must adhere to mm -hmm. when we do cataract surgery. We must have a wound. Yeah? We must have an opening in the back. Yeah? We must be able to suck the lens out or take the lens out and lastly put the lens in. What FLEX does is it does the first half of the surgery, namely the creation of the wound. Instead of using a diamond knife or a metal blade to create the wound on the cornea, we use a laser to create the wound. What is the difference? Mm. The difference is uh, you can tailor uh, the, the size of the wound, the length of the wound and the depth of the wound and even the geometry of the wound using a laser, perhaps a bit more accurately compared to using a diamond blade or a diamond knife. However, I must add here that uh, in terms of advantages of the laser against the conventional way, the advantage is not that much, except in terms of slight more, slightly more precision in terms of the creation of the wound. Mm -hmm. yeah? right. Now, uh, the next step would be, or the next thing that FLEX helps the surgeon is the creation of the opening in the back that right. holds your lens. Mm -hmm. you know? Traditionally, if you do phaco emulsification or ECCE, you have to, through your uh, corneal wound, you insert a metal forcep to grasp onto the capsule. The capsule is very thin. At the thinnest point, it's only one micron. Mm -hmm. yeah? One micron is about your hair divided by 70. Right. Yeah? Now, you're mm. inserting a metal forceps. Right. And uh, common sense would tell mm. you that it may be injurious mm. sometimes. Right. Well, 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 we are trained, I suppose, uh, as eye surgeons you know, to, to operate in a very tight space. Mm -hmm. So ideally, we shouldn't be touching any other parts of the eye. But uh, I think the advantage of the flex in this uh, setting is that, uh, you see, if you do it manually, I've got to use that metal forcep to grasp the capsule, then make a, literally a, a tear open, a, a round opening mm -hmm. of the capsule. Yeah? Even in the best of hands, uh, it's quite impossible to actually for me to get a perfectly sized uh, capsulorexis, that's what we call it. Uh, and maybe the shape of the circle or opening may not be a perfectly round circle. But if you use a machine to create a perfectly round circle, I think the machine will beat 
any expert anytime. Right. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, the other advantage of flex in terms of this opening is you can actually determine the exact sizing. Yeah? Uh, th this can be very useful if you use certain type of lenses. Yeah? Now, uh, because sometimes you want to aim for an opening of let's say 5.5 millimeter. Mm -hmm. yeah? You can do it manually, but sometimes you know, being man, you know, right. sometimes you go out a little bit, it gets a bit larger or a bit smaller. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? The third method, uh, the third advantage of flex is uh, it can also pre-divide and pre-soften the lens even before you introduce your FACO emulsification. It pre-divides and pre-softens. Let's That's talk right. about mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. Whoa, how does it pre-divide? Right. So the laser, just like how it created the wound on the cornea, opening on the capsule, the laser will also cut the lens into smaller pieces. Yeah? Some systems are able to cut it into some waffle-like pieces so that when you introduce your suction device or your FACO emulsification device, you can literally just suck the lens out without having to use too much energy. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what do I mean by energy? If you remember my earlier uh, introduction about Kalman's uh, uh, invention, mm -hmm. FACO emulsification, the tip uses ultrasound to soften the lens before you can suck it out. Because right. the lens is hard. Mm -hmm. yeah? Now, the problem with ultrasound is if the lens is very hard and if the surgeon uses excessive ultrasound, too much energy will can, inji can injure the, the eye. Right. The cornea, you can get burns. You can damage the inner lining of your cornea. We call it the endothelium. If the endothelium is too severely damaged, you may have done a perfect cataract surgery but the next day, the patient will not be able to see because right. the cornea will become all swollen. Yeah? Then you need something like a corneal transplant. Yeah? So ultrasound is needed, but you need to regulate its use. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I, I believe in flags. It allows the surgeon to use less ultrasound and in some cases, actually not to use ultrasound at all. Mm -hmm. yeah? because I, I think in modern cataract surgery, it's the ultrasound that sometimes can damage right. the eye. Hmm? In short, uh, what we know now is that with with machines or with the help of lasers uh, or laser assisted uh, cataract surgeries uh, we get precision and precision is what is most needed in uh, of course cataract surgeries right yeah having said that there is actually a lively debate going on mm -hmm. still on whether flex or femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery is is it better than conventional surgery right. my answer to that is yes and no you mm -hmm. know uh, I, I i will not say that femtosecond laser cataract surgery is safer or better than conventional surgery you you still rely on the skills of the surgeon mm -hmm. i would look at femtosecond laser cataract surgery as a new tool for the mm -hmm. surgeon to use you know if the tool is used wisely or expertly, you get good results. Right. If you don't use it well, even with femtosecond laser cataract surgery, you can have complications. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the complications unique to femtosecond second laser cataract surgery is, for example, the opening in the back. Right. Sometimes, uh, if you are not careful, can actually tear mm -hmm. yeah, because sometimes you have small little tags created by the laser. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the newer laser systems are so, getting better. So I, I mm. guess I guess the argument here now is if we depend too much on machines, then where's the uh, skill of the surgeon that's itself? Right, I, I right. guess that's the Correct. the idea of this whole uh, narrative with regards to the argument that's right. uh, with surgery. But very quickly, uh, we've mm. got about two minutes left. Very sure. quickly, we hear a lot of myths. Uh, I mean, uh, most of us have parents or grandparents with cataracts, mm. always hear stories of uh, botched surgeries, mm -hmm. uh, alternative treatment. Right. Uh, what kind of advice mm. or, or tip can you give us right. with regards to this? Because a lot of people fear it, or oh, I don't want to take my mother mm. for a surgery, mm. it may come back. Right. You know, yeah. you, you, you get, you get sure. these kinds of excuses all sure. the time. Right. So what would be your tip mm. for us? Right. Now, uh, as in any surgery, there, there is always a risk for complication. Yeah? Right. So when you have complications, that's when you listen to all these stories where things did not go so well. Yeah? But I, I like also to highlight about you know, this common myth whereby you, know, you hear people saying, or some uh, doctors actually even saying this, that oh, if you have cataracts, you need to have surgery because if you don't do it, you'll go blind. That's not right. That's all right. That's right. Cataract should be seen as a natural aging process. There are different stages of cataract early ones, 
the most advanced ones. Uh, but cataract will not cause permanent blindness. Even if you have the most severest form of cataract and you can't even see any form of light, if the eye is healthy, once you have the cataract done, you can see again. So, so I, I, I don't like uh, this idea that, that you know, patients sometimes come to see me you know, after seeing someone else. Saying, or that, uh, someone told me that you know, if you, do, you have cataracts, you don't remove it, now you'll go blind. Mm -hmm. That's a myth. You, know? right. you do not go blind. Yeah, even if you can't see, you can see again once you have the cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, uh, when should you have cataract surgery? Well, uh, you, sh you should only have cataract surgery when the cataract is causing you problems. Right. Now, my father is already 74. He's, he's got cataracts. But I haven't asked him to have a cataract surgery, not because I'm not afraid that he will go blind, it's because he's seeing well. Mm -hmm. He's got no problems. Yeah? Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, coming back to complications of cataract surgery, yeah, complications do happen. Yeah? So things like infection, sometimes the back that holds the lens ruptures and the lens falls to the back. Some people get the retinal detachment. But these are more of a rarity rather than the norm. Mm -hmm. yeah? Modern cataract surgery is safe, mm -hmm. the incision is small, the risk in, uh, of infection is very low. It's about 0.01% in a well-established uh, setting. Mm -hmm. yeah? So the infection is very minimal. Uh, in fact, if you were to look at all, uh, all surgeries in total, cataract surgery is number one on the list. Right. I mean, you compare with appendix or cardiac surgery or whatever surgery, more cataract surgeries are done in the world compared to any mm -hmm. form of surgery. Uh, we've got about 20 seconds left. Very quickly, for uh, those of us who are worried about mm. uh, people with diabetes, uh, diabetes mm -hmm. or diabetes mellitus, right. and the people who want to do cataract surgery, mm. um, is it safe for them? Yeah. Uh, it is safe uh, whether you have diabetes or not. You know, it, it does not matter. In fact, in some cases, diabetes needs to be monitored. And if you have a dense cataract, the doctor cannot see through your cataract. Then you've got to have the cataract surgery so that we can monitor your diabetes. So the answer to that would be whether you have diabetes or not does not matter. But certainly, you need to control the diabetes well because you don't want uh, problems related to, di to the diabetes to progress if the diabetes is not well controlled. Right. On that note, Doc, it was a pleasure and an honour having you right here in the Thank studio. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, we just spoke to Dr. Aino Rahman bin Dr. Anwar Masduki, consultant ophthalmologist from Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare, walking us through cataract surgery, the 101 on cataract surgery right here on Medical Today. Thank you very much for staying with us. We'll be back right after this break. Stay with us. Tuan-tuan, hujung minggu macam ni saya dan keluarga mesti membersihkan halaman rumah. Kawasan luar rumah ni lah Edis cepat membiak. Salur air, pasu bunga, kolam hiasan, tayar terpakai. Dalam rumah pula, dulang alas peti sejuk, pasu bunga, kolam mandi, tempayan air adalah tempat Edis bertelur. Sebab tu, jangan lupa masukkan racun pembunuh jentik-jentik. Selamat! Bila rumah kita bersih, tak ada can lah Edis nak membiak. Tak ada Edis, tak ada denggi. Bersama mencegah Edis. Mengupas isu semasa, merangkumi politik, ekonomi, sukan serta hiburan. Membawakan anda agenda pentas dunia. Saksikan Ruang Bicara setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat. BNC Wahrungsing能趁三亚阿摩伊拉这个那么好的机会就到全马各地旅游我还能了解各州的文化 
அரசியல் பொருளாதாரம் சமூகவியல் அறிவியல் விளையாட்டு கலை இலக்கியம் அனைத்துலக செய்தி என உடனுக்குடன் தகவல்களை கொண்டு வருகிறோம் புதிய பொழிவோடு புதிய நம்பிக்கையோடு வர்ணாமா தமிழ் செய்திகள் வர்ணாமா அலைவரிசையில் மட்டுமே Welcome back to Medical Today, Jared Ratnam with you. We just spoke to uh, Dr. Ainur with regards to eye surgeries. We went through the various uh, systems they have right now with regards to cataract surgeries in Malaysia. We spoke to a good Dr. Ainur Rahman. From there, let's move on to uh, ladies' problems. Now, uh, the role of women in this country has taken a decisively crucial turn with all the recent happenings in the world. Now, women leaders are now in growing numbers. Just take, for example, our Deputy Prime Minister, the first female Deputy Prime Minister, I might add. Uh, it is history for our nation. But having said that, uh, women come with uh, their problems. They have a set of problems uh, that they have to deal with uh, when it comes to certain parts of their lives. Uh, we're going to be talking about pre- and post-menopause symptoms Management and Prevention, and joining me in the studio is none other than Dr. Alice Prakima Michael, founder of Dr. Alice Total Wellness Center and Ageless Medispa. That was a mouthful, doctor. Thank you very much for joining Thanks, us. Jeff. Well, pre and post menopause symptoms, management and prevention. Uh, where do we begin with this uh, topic or talking about uh, menopause when it comes to women? I think uh, you were saying about women holding very important positions indeed. Right. But I'd also like to urge Asian women because they have been shown to be uh, more shy mm -hmm. or they are afraid to talk too much about their issues. So right. I think women do undergo do, aging. Do we still have that stigma in this day and age? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they still do. Compared, there's been studies done that compares Western women as opposed to Asian women, and Asian women do not voice their symptoms out as well. They can be very ominous indeed, but mm -hmm. they will not voice it just because they think they will put too much of pressure on their spouses or their children, or they just don't want, they think they are making a big fuss, so they would not want to do. So I would urge women to be as successful as some of our leaders, but at the same time look after their health as well. Right. So right. all women mm -hmm. undergo aging and together comes menopause. But the, the other thing here is with your clientele, you're meeting middle class, upper middle class women, some, some of them come from uh, really affluent uh, societies. Now when you meet these women too, and I'm, I'm guessing that these women come with a lot of knowledge and some of them well educated too yes. are they still coy talking about things like this yes of course some of them are coming because they need to put up a front in their work in their career fronts or mm -hmm. at home mm -hmm. uh, but they do come to uh, look for their skin or for their hair loss or for their weight issues and uh, it's also becomes important for me to educate these women right. to say these things are coming from inside mm -hmm. from hormonal changes from undergoing peri and post menopause yeah, but to, to just say that it, it just uh, it, it is because of hormonal changes that these things are happening to you is quite a broad statement right yes. and when a woman comes to see you uh, do you, uh, what are the telltale signs that they are reaching menopause yeah, everybody talks about hot flashes and mm -hmm. uh, sweating and I'm having so palpitations yeah, yeah, yeah. and of, of course, you know, having mood swings, you know, at that time the husband would tell the wife, you know, uh, don't have irritability, you're undergoing menopause, you right. know. But a lot of women there are well in control of these symptoms, they know how to manage them, but then they have other symptoms like increasing amount of fatigue mm -hmm. loss of libido for once is a very common right. issue a lot increasing of women amount can, of fatigue can can be an allusion to uh, adrenal fatigue fatigue syndrome yeah it all comes together with mm -hmm. menopause for women women mm -hmm. somehow with having estrogen in their body they they carry on quite well they are able to take all the pressures that go through adolescence, 20s, 30s, 40s, mm -hmm. and towards 45 onwards, many of them are starting to have even early menopause these days, right. and they start to have irregular menstruation, and even if they could go and get some medication to fix this problem, mm -hmm. they still suffer with the major 
severe fatigue. They, right. They're not able to sleep very well at night, right. and estrogen so will is, affect is the way they sleep. So is this a telltale sign of uh, yes. uh, menopause? Yes, because when estrogen goes down, mm -hmm. automatically a lot of the other supporting hormones like dehydropyandestrone, cortisol, you're talking about uh, adrenal fatigue, which is a lack of cortisol, right. all of them do go down. And some of many, many women are also subclinically, they don't have a normal blood test does not show they are hypothyroid, mm -hmm. but they actually are hypothyroid. They have low thyroid levels, all of which goes on to fatigue. Mm -hmm. And then they start to have weight gain in places. Of course, other than that, they do have those in the early times of perimenopause and early menopause, the body is kind of trying to push out the mm -hmm. estrogen. Mm -hmm. And there are times when they have a nice, you know, energy level and mm -hmm. suddenly it crashes down when the ovary cannot keep up with the production of estrogen. Right. And then they go into the severe stress where, and uh, fatigue where they are not able to take their normal mm -hmm. work so activities. So if, if you're watching this saying, I know this all too well, I think the next question is, what do I do? Now that I know that I'm overly fatigued and you know everything's going haywire, mood swings, so on and so forth, what can I do? You always you're a great proponent of talking about inflammation within the body or inflammation markers. Yes. Uh, yeah. What's your advice with regards to this? Very simply, for those of us who don't understand inflammation markers, uh, how can you simplify it for us? First of all, this is the time when the biomarkers of different forms of aging starts to come in. So of course, I believe knowledge is key, and so women have to be proactive and go get themselves properly tested. Mm -hmm. So when they test it, of course, it's not just a normal hormone test alone. We are looking at all the inflammatory markers because having lack of estrogen not just stops your menstruation, but mm -hmm. it also increases inflammation. Inflammation is like a fire, slow burning fire that's eating up all our energy reserves, our hormonal reserves, mm -hmm. all our health reserves in another way. Yeah, but, but when you talk to uh, people within the health industry, there's, there's now an alternative industry that talks about uh, eating healthy, about having anti-inflammatory uh, vitamins and also nutrition which is which is taken in by it's all proven Gerard mm -hmm. so if people deny this fact then they are living in a shell right. from which they will have to be pulled out mm -hmm. someday or other mm -hmm. that's all I have to say about that but we look at inflammatory markers there is a theory of inflammaging mm -hmm. that means inflammation causing aging all right. our diseases non-communicable diseases us a little more inflammation yeah. to inflammaging yeah, right. inflammation as a major cause of Life aging. Life doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are looking at uh, CRPs, for example, okay. C-reactive proteins, which is, proteins. Which is what, showing interleukin-6, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which is showing that there is an increased inflammation and your body is suffering from the low-grade inflammation that's going on inside. And it starts to block your arteries, gives you atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. and starts to have inflammation even causing you type 2 diabetes. Right. And then all the associated problems, heart attacks, strokes, and high blood pressure, and so on. Of course, cancers, most of the cancers, other than genetically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, got cancers, they are inflammation-based. So your work based. as a wellness physician is to nip it in the butt. Be yes, it's always looking for early biomarkers, mm -hmm. uh, listening to people very, very carefully, because sometimes they may just come and say, I'm dropping hair and I can't go to work anymore. Everyone notice, notices this. I had nice hair before. Right. So it's not just listening to them, asking them some pointed questions and bringing out what are the other things. Many women are nowadays, they are afraid to talk about libido matters, right. but they do have, they have painful sexual intercourse. They mm -hmm. have lack of libido, which is causing them extra stress. But it also says that their hormones are low. Many women are coming to me and saying, oh, I have very wrinkly skin now and I'm starting to have pigmentation and I'm having age spots and so mm -hmm. on, and mm -hmm. I'm having sagging again. But then we know when the skin is undergoing all these changes, the same changes are also happening in the vagina. It's right. happening in the urinary tract, it's happening in the urethra and the bladder. Mm -hmm. So causing the women, so if I ask a pointed question, so do you also have some difficulty, uh, do you have to wake up often to go to the toilet at night or do you have stress incontinence when you sneeze or laugh suddenly? Mm -hmm. Are you dribbling? Yeah, that's they another may thing. come we, out with it and say it. Women don't talk about stress incontinence. They don't. They mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. So it's for 
a physician like me to ask them those questions, bring it out, run the necessary tests, right. and then to uh, come to a conclusion, educate them, because mm -hmm. they are not aware of it many times, right. and then educate them and go on from there. See, whatever you're talking about, and we've got about three minutes left, and maybe you can walk us through this. Uh, for me, it's, it just points to one direction, psychological problems. You know, women, when they come up with all, all these, ex not excuses, when they have all these symptoms, it then, you know, plays in their heads, it affects them psychologically. How do you deal with that as a wellness physician? Of course, many of them come to me in tears as well. Mm. They have panic attacks or anxiety. And sometimes it's physical symptoms that has caused them that much of distress. Right. And sometimes we do know that all these symptoms are also linked to lack of estrogen. Mm -hmm. If they are predisposed to having depression or they are undergoing very difficult situations at work or in the family or elsewhere, they may also come out with depression symptoms as well. Right. So, so it is they... not just always, mm. uh, it is not a psychosomatic problem as mm -hmm. well. It mm -hmm. is also a physical problem. It... So when we test these women for hormones, we would find low levels of estrogen, high or very low levels of cortisol. We'll find that they do not have DHEA, which is a strong hormone. It mm. makes the woman's body, the muscle, the bone and also the mind strong right. so when we are able to introduce of course other than counseling and other methods of psychotherapy mm -hmm. there is ways that these women can improve themselves and they do not have to be they can be very very productive if we treat them right at this time mm. before we pull the handbrakes on the show or this this week's episode what are the options available to the modern day woman who wants to face menopause head on? Oh, there's so many things available. If you think I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to age naturally. I'm not going to treat myself. I'm not going to see Dr. Ellis or anyone else to treat myself for this. Then of course, take it easy. You know, smell the roses. Make sure you have a long, hot pot it's bath before you sleep. And done. <laughs> Do deep breathing, it mm. helps a lot. It calms down all our nerves, the neurotransmitters. Eat very healthy, eat in small, healthful bites mm -hmm. and do not go because many women have pica they like to eat salt and sugary stuff which will cause women to Instead gain weight them. and no woman who is overweight is happy okay so then eat sensibly and do exercise daily maybe it's not the time to do very hard you know exercise but you will benefit because osteoporosis is a major problem that mm -hmm. happens together with menopause so mm -hmm. we can actually reduce it but of course if you say i'm going to proactively treat this mm -hmm. then you go to a doctor you can trust and who knows about how can pr how you can prevent the problems that happen with menopause do not wait for diabetes cancer blood pressure to come on before that we we can do biomarkers we can right. find what are the problems and we can give you treatments we are now doing a lot of work with bio-identical hormones. We have ministry accredited labs which produce for us doctors with prescriptions, the correct kind of hormones that you can apply or you can take orally, mm -hmm. or you can opt towards the traditional hormone replacement treatment as well. Right. On that note, before we say goodbye to Dr. Alice and of course bring her back on another day, if you have any doubts about medical illnesses, do not fret my friend. All you have to do is send us an email and uh, whatever your problem is, your medical condition is, send it to us. And we are also going to do one better. We'll send you a bottle of multivitamins. And that's uh, uh, also thank you for those of you who have sent in emails previously. Uh, I think we've received almost 56 inquiries. So 56 bottles are going to be coming your way. Just watch out for that mailman who will be coming your way very, very soon. So an example of one of our emails is a 50-year-old male. He talks about weight loss for the past three years. He's 176 centimeters and he's 54 kilograms. All medical results are good. He does exercise regularly. He's seen a gastro, done a colonoscopy to uh, what can be the cause of weight loss. Well, uh, of course, according to the doctors or health specialists who have seen this, they say uh, the information provided is insufficient for us to advise on the condition. Your weight loss could be due to many underlying conditions and it could be due to some lifestyle changes. So therefore, the advice is for you to go see a consultant uh, consult, or consult a general physician and uh, get another, of course, thorough examination done and of course, uh, also get another opinion. If you have a question for us, send that question to ask at medicaltoday.com.
medicaltoday.my. That's ask at medicaltoday.my. Send us an email and we'll be more than happy to furnish you with whatever information and also give you a bottle of uh, vitamins for free. Thank you very much for staying with us right here on today's episode of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam signing off. We're also thanking Dr. Alice for joining us. Thank you very much, Dr. Alice.